program manager with the localization lab. Um, she coordinates all of the localization um, that the lab supports. Um, um, she coordinates all the localization that the localization lab supports um, with projects, um, building localization resources, um, and then bridging the chasm, the, 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 the divide between uh, developers, end users, and then re regional organization partners. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about localizing um, applications. Uh, breaking down language barriers. So please, Erin, over to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. For that <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, my name is Erin McConnell, and I'm the localization program coordinator with Localization Lab. Um, welcome to breaking down language barriers, uh, localizing for access, activism, and preservation. Um, so Localization Lab is a nonprofit organization that focuses on localizing technologies and resources. Um, specifically, I would describe this as a community. Um, we're about 6,000 volunteer contributors, along with developers, human rights organizations, and civil society groups that collaborate together to localize um, internet freedom tools and uh, educational resources that support them. Um, internet freedom tools is kind of a broad um, umbrella. Uh, what it incorporates um, for us is digital security tools, um, as well as circumvention tools. So secure messaging, um, VPNs, um, proxy tools, and then educational resources to help teach people um, how to use those tools, teach them about those different concepts. Um, in addition, uh, the vast majority of the content that we work on is open source, um, say for very few, um, few exceptions, um, because we also value uh, open source principles like um, open exchange, <laughs> participation in community. Um, and over the past five years, we've worked on over 70 different open source digital security and circumvention uh, projects, localizing them into over 100 different languages and dialects. So why I care so much about localization? Why is it so important? Why is it important for us as an organization? Why should it be important for you? Um, we'll just look at some of the basic numbers in this kind of intense slide. Um, so of about 7.5 billion people on the planet, it's only just over 3.5 billion that currently have access to the internet. And of those 3.5 billion, only about 25% are native or non-native speakers of English. Uh, and then the rest of um, the about 4 billion people that currently don't have access to the internet, it's about 80% of them who don't speak English. So it's a significant portion of the population that um, doesn't necessarily have access to content um, or technologies that are available in only in English. Um, so despite that fact, about over 50% of the content on the internet is currently in English. Um, and then just to add to all of that, um, it's estimated, or some research has shown that about 85% of people uh, won't use a service or a technology if it's not available in their native language. So whether or not they speak English, they might not choose to use a service because they don't necessarily feel comfortable using um, technologies or accessing content in that language. So um, what does this mean and uh, how does this translate to, to real um, individual experiences? Uh, well, our executive director, Dragon Cowan, was on a panel about two years ago called um, What Languages Are, Who Is, uh, I forgot the name of the session, but um, <laughs> what languages um, are available on the internet or um, who decides what languages are available on the internet? Um, one of the panelists on, um, uh, in that discussion was a Sapotec activist and localizer uh, named Rodrigo Perez. And um, Rodrigo uh, first gained access to a computer that, had uh, that was connected to the internet about 10 years ago. Um, however, he opened up NetSecure Explorer and saw that everything was in English. Content was in English, the application was in English, and he decided uh, immediately that the internet is not for me. And it was another five years before he actually came back to um, 
to, to try and access the internet and, recognize, and realize that several applications had been localized into Spanish, that there was more content available in Spanish online, and he was actually able to, to benefit from um, using the internet and start contributing to the digital space. Um, unfortunately for other people in his community, however, who did not have the luxury benefit of speaking Spanish as a second language, um, they were Zapotec speakers, um, they still um, had that linguistic barrier um, keeping them from accessing the digital space. And so Rodrigo started focusing a lot of his efforts on localizing open source technologies into Zapotec so that the rest of his community would be able to access information. Um, and so I'm going to be throwing a lot of quotes here because these are from actual contributors that <laughs> work on projects of ours and um, they're, they're very meaningful, at least may hope they are meaningful for you. Um, this is from uh, Chido Musosa, who is a localizer that works um, on making content available in Shona, which is a language that's spoken in Zimbabwe. Um, for a recent article that she wrote for um, Localization Lab, um, she said, if technology and the internet are going to make any inroads into developing nations, it's important to understand that technology will only be adopted when the local culture and language are reflected in the interface of the tools we are expected to use. Um, so in addition to just simple access to content, um, in, uh, so in addition to, to linguistic access um, being a barrier to, to accessing content on the internet, um, there are also um, physical world um, implications to not having access to that information, human rights implications. Um, and this kind of goes on with what Antonella was mentioning. If um, a tool like the Tor browser is not available in um, the language that you speak, then you don't have the ability to, um, to benefit from um, using that circumvention technology to get around censorship or to secure your communications, um, secure your uh, browsing activity. Um, in addition, if you, let's say that you're a human rights defender or a journalist working on a high-risk context, if you don't have information available about how you can um, secure your communications between contacts or secure your data so that um, it's um, so it can't be accessed by um, adversaries um, then this can lead to physical um, consequences um, so in addition to globalization being important to access and um, keeping people safe in the digital sphere and the physical sphere Localization is also um, a key aspect of language preservation and activism. Um, now that so much content, um, that we access so much information and content through the digital sphere, through technologies, um, a big part of keeping languages alive and rejuvenating them um, is making technology and content on the internet available in those languages. Uh, so we've recently worked with an Aymara community um, an Aymara speaking community, Aymara is an indigenous language spoken in Bolivia. And despite the fact that about 17% of, of Bolivians um, speak Aymara, it's still considered a minority language. And um, use of Aymara in like the 70s and 80s was actually banned in, um, in education sphere and official spaces. Um, so people are really struggling um, to, to preserve the language, to ensure that young people start speaking it and um, as a way to preserve culture, um, history, and heritage. Um, this is a, a quote from um, Edwin Kispe. Kispe is the executive director of Hakiaru, which is a, um, an organization in Bolivia that's trying to bring Aymara into the digital space. Um, he said, we ask ourselves, who are we? What is our identity? For us, language is our identity. If we lose our language, we lose our traditions, our culture, our stories, our ancestral knowledge, we lose everything. Um, so, um, uh, yes, so um, for Hakiaru and for a lot of other um, organizations throughout um, Latin America, speakers of indigenous languages, as well as here um, in, in mainland Europe, um, speakers of languages like Breton, of Irish Gaelic, of um, Welsh, Occitan, languages that have traditionally been marginalized um, and, and speakers have been oppressed. Um, creating, um, localizing technology is, is a way to preserve the language and it's also um, in itself kind of an act of resistance um, against um, the kind of colonial uh, dominant languages. Um, 
And one contributor to uh, Breton Technologies, um, Tom, when we asked him why he focuses specifically on technology, um, he emphasized that um, it's really important to localize technology as a way to specifically target youth and get youth to speak uh, the Breton language. So in addition to um, working on security technologies, he also localizes video games and educational materials. Um, and then lastly, at, at Localization Lab, uh, we really believe that a diversity of perspectives, opinions, and backgrounds um, results in more creativity and more ingenuity. And so in addition to just making sure that people have access to information online, it's really important for us that we also help to promote content creation in other languages from people from different backgrounds um, and also development um, in, in different languages as well. This is just a quote from Nelson Mandela that if you talk to a man in the language he understands, that goes to his head if you talk to him in his language that goes to his heart. Um, so at this point, I, I was originally just going to talk about some best practices for localizations and processes that you can put in place to ensure that you're engaging communities in the localization process that you end up with um, effective um, localization and high quality translations. Um, but I decided to kind of change course and talk a little bit more about some of the more complex um, issues, cultural and linguistic issues that affect localization that you can't necessarily plan for um, with uh, technical solutions. Uh, so we just, we just had the tour project uh, presentation. How many people are familiar with pluggable transports? Um, who, who would, uh, knows how to translate pluggable transports into another language? Or how would you even approach translating pluggable transports into another language? So it's, it's already a really complicated technical concept to understand. Um, so translating into another language is <coughs> an incredibly difficult task. Um, so that this is something that we struggle with with Tor Project um, and, and several other projects. You have these, these concepts um, that you can't even necessarily effectively describe in English um, in order to translate them into other languages. So um, ultimately, um, it's necessary to have a lot of conversation around these terms um, and discuss um, approaches for how to, to best articulate these concepts uh, depending, on, um, depending on language um, and also different cultural contexts. So for some languages, pluggable transports, um, groups of translators have decided to just use the, the English term um, and to borrow it directly because it, they decided that it is, it's better than any other option available um, in, in our language. Um, so better just have it in English and then describe what the term means or the, the concept of how pluggable transports work um, using the language. Um, other languages have tried to do literal translations of pluggable transports, um, which in, um, and for example, this is not the, the option that um, this, this was chosen for Spanish, but you could say like transporte and chavale, just direct translation. Um, other um, languages have decided to um, try and translate the meaning of what pluggable transports actually do. Um, so saying, Um, so, of course, pluggable transports is a complicated um, term to, to translate, understandably. Um, but what about a term or a concept like privacy? Um, so you might think that the term privacy, that the concept of privacy, is pretty much universal. Um, but in fact, it, it isn't necessarily. And sometimes translation of, of something as simple as privacy is very complicated. Um, in Burmese, for example, there actually isn't a term for privacy. Um, and there also isn't a real concept of privacy, tradition. Like this is a very new concept for a lot of people. So how do you explain something like privacy where, when um, there are parts of, of Burma in which doors are not locked and sometimes there are no doors? This is direct feedback that we've gotten from localizers working on projects in Burmese. 
Um, when email and social media account passwords are shared with friends and family, when phone passwords are shared with phone shop attendants, like when you want to um, have add new applications to your, to your phone, you take them to a phone assistant, give them the passcode, and they would actually install content for you, have access to all of your data. Um, so all of these like, analogies that you might use to explain con the concept of privacy to people, like, oh, it, the concept of privacy in the digital space to people, um, using like, physical work examples, blocking the door, or um, a, yeah, having maybe a safe box or something. Um, sometimes those don't work. Um, and coming to expand this, um, this is not just limited to languages like Burmese, um, this has also been a, a complication trying to translate digital security content into Khmer where privacy um, almost directly translates to secret or secrecy, um, which means that often privacy and secrecy are conflated. Uh, so how do you um, how do you talk about um, general privacy um, in terms of general like digital hygiene um, as opposed to things that you have to keep um, like privacy as as, as a right. Um, and, and uh, digital hygiene uh, concept as opposed to, um, you know, information that you're trying to hide from others because it, it might be bad. Um, so, um, yeah, among other uh, language challenges that we face on a regular basis, um, in addition to complex technical terms and concepts, I'm dealing with the, like, innumerable uh, neologisms that pop up constantly uh, in technology. Um, the use of metaphors and analogies in, in tools and in, um, and in documentation, um, idiomatic expressions and wordplay that can't translate directly into other languages or are not relevant for other cultures, um, and then also the lack of institutional <laughs> academic structures to support development and standardization. Uh, things like, uh, with, actually, with, that dictate what <laughs> words are, <laughs> are okay to use and what are not okay to use. Sometimes they do come in handy. Um, so, um, okay, so also we have dialect. <laughs> Obviously I'm, I'm not very concise. Um, <laughs> so dialectal variations and conflicts, um, things as simple as um, the localization spelled with a Z in America in the US instead of with an S in the UK, or use of computadora or ordenador in, um, in Spanish. So those might be small, very, uh, small differences that um, people account for very easily. Um, but sometimes dialectical differences are significant enough that they can cause a lot of confusion, or um, they're seen as uh, a translation. A translation can be seen as very inappropriate and can affect whether or not somebody feels comfortable using a tool technology. Um, other things that, um, that you learn by communicating with your target communities, and whether or not um, the, there's a high rates of illiteracy, and you want to focus on using um, symbols or um, icons as opposed to using a lot of text. Um, if a culture is an oral, uh, if somebody has an oral culture, um, and, their con um, and they prefer having content that's audiovisual as opposed to written. Um, cultural relevance of, of design. Um, in some user research that uh, Second News did um, in Tibet with Tibetan diaspora, um, they were looking at a panic button application, and the panic button was actually a biohazard symbol that was white. First of all, nobody understood a biohazard symbol, and also white was interpreted as, well, a color for purity and peace. So people were like, oh, well, this must be a good button. Um, yes, delete all of my content. <laughs> um, so also unique technical specifications um, might come up that you can't uh, prepare for um, if you're not uh, in direct communication with communities. Um, Burmese, for example, there is a Unicode font for Burmese, which um, is, is available. 
Um, however, the vast majority of Burmese still prefer to use a non-Unicode font called Zauji. So your application might be translated in the Unicode font, might be available in the Unicode font, but if people can't input text using the non-Unicode font, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to use the tool. Um, so then kind of uh, lastly, and I'm like, I really botched this, and I'm not going to get into everything. Um, but uh, another thing that we really focus on at Localization Lab is like life after localization. So how do you actually um, communicate, uh, how do you actually share these tools with your communities? Um, how do you train people um, on how to use these tools using um, regional um, and like cultural, um, culturally relevant uh, examples and contexts? Um, this is an example, we had a Japanese um, group that uh, localized Onion Browser into Japanese. And afterward, they created a Twitter account so that they could um, talk about Onion Browser in Japanese to a Japanese audience. They created images like this one right here, the software destroyed censorship. Um, and this was in response to um, um, NTT, which is Japanese I, um, ISP, announcing that we would voluntarily start blocking um, pirate, uh, pirate websites. Um, and then also, um, this is a great example of um, how to use culturally relevant um, devices uh, that people understand to explain complex concepts. Um, Rangoli is uh, an art form from the, the Indian subcontinent that involves um, using dots and, and lines to create intricate designs and, um, and uh, yeah, create intricate designs. Uh, it's an art form, it's passed down through generations. And um, one of uh, this individual, Nadia Matara, um, started using Rangoli to explain how networks work with communities throughout India. India. So using this art form um, that people already felt very comfortable using um, to show like, okay, what would a local area network look like, or um, how does information, um, how would you pass information um, through through networks. Right. So we're done. And I didn't cover a lot of stuff that I was supposed to cover. But basically, the key thing that I want, um, I hope people take away from this, is that A, localization is very important um, and to reach communities around the globe. And B, that involving communities and having a lot of um, direct <coughs> communication with your target end users is really important to ensuring that content is actually organized.